The homily for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, the epistle is taken from the Apostle St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, such is the assurance I have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He also it is who has made us fit ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministration of death which was engraved in letters upon stones was inaugurated in such glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it, shall not the ministration of the Spirit be still more glorious? For if there is glory in the ministration that condemned, much more does the ministration that justifies abound in glory. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to to St. Luke. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer got up to test him, saying, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? He answered and said, You shall love the Lord thy God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind and, with the, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. But he, wishing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in with robbers, who after both stripping him and beating him went their way, leaving him half death. But as it happened, a certain priest was going down the same way, and when he saw him, he passed by. And likewise a Levite also, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came upon him, and seeing him, was moved with compassion. And he went up to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and setting him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I on my way back will repay you. Which of these three, in your opinion, proved himself neighbor to him who fell among robbers? And he said, He who took pity on him. Jesus said to him, Go and do also in like manner. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear friends, today's Gospel begins by pointing out to us the importance of a proof of uh, appreciating our faith and everything that comes with it. When our Lord says to the people that were near him, he says, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it. These words can be applicable to us as well. Blessed are the eyes that see what we see. Blessed are our senses that are able to attend the true Holy Mass and the true sacraments and to hear the true faith. And it is very important for us to appreciate it. Many among us have grown from traditional families, grew in this all our lives, and never really appreciated the effort that it took for our parents to keep the faith, the effort that, it, that, it, uh, that the priests had to put in order to keep the true Mass and the true sacraments. We don't appreciate it. Much like the Jews, who were used to the preaching, perhaps, of our Lord, did not appreciate it for what it was. And our Lord makes it important. He says to us, you need to appreciate these things. You need to know that these things that you have are a privilege that many don't have. That many have wished to see these things and could not see them. Many don't even know they exist. The same thing applies to us. You go to Mass often. You receive the sacraments often, hopefully. You go to communion, you see these beautiful ceremonies, and you've grown with them, and to you they are normal. 
But for a moment, consider and think how many millions, how many thousands of people have never gotten to experience the true Mass. How many people who wish to be Catholics have never had in their lives, perhaps, a valid sacrament or a valid priest talking to them. And so these things that you experience are things that are an undescribable privilege and that we should appreciate as our Lord had the people uh, try to understand in his times. Now, one of the big parts about our depreciation for our faith is obviously the understanding of it. You appreciate something when you try to learn about it and you try to understand it. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you had a wife and, or that there is a wife and a husband. And the husband says to the wife, I appreciate you. I, I love you. She says, okay, um, yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, I, I see you every weekend for at least an hour. And, you know, let's say that a person prays the rosary. In this case, he would say, uh, and I, I talk to you 15 minutes distractedly, not really paying attention to what you say, but, you know, I, I give you those 15 minutes of almost listening to you. I appreciate you. Well, the wife wouldn't be happy, and she would know perfectly well that he doesn't appreciate her if that's all he does. What do you do when you appreciate someone? You try to learn about that person. You try to learn about their history, the meaning behind their actions. Why do they do what they do? What do they mean when they say things, when they do things? That's when you really care for someone, when you really appreciate someone. The same applies to our faith. You don't appreciate your faith if all you do is see it once every weekend and maybe give it 15 or 10 minutes of distracted attention every day. If you really appreciate your faith, you need to know it. You need to know the history behind it, the meaning behind every ceremony, the meaning behind every word that it has. And you need to know how to defend it. And that's very important as well. And today's gospel teaches us very meaningful points about some of the most difficult problems that there are against our faith today. Let's go into the gospel further. Our Lord uh, is asked by a doctor of the law, what is the greatest commandment of all? This, as I've said before, as you've heard in other sermons, I'm sure, was a very debated topic at the time. For us, it's not. For us as Catholics, this is very clear. Our Lord has said it. But in, the, in those times for the Hebrews, it was a debated topic. Remember, in the Old Testament, there is hundreds of commandments. And so they were asking, what, what is the greatest commandment? And here, in the answer that our Lord gives, he actually destroys two great enemies of our faith. He destroys the tenets of Protestantism. And he destroys also the tenets of Vatican II. Let's go into each one of those. When our Lord is asked, what must I do to save my soul? Actually, the question is that. The, the scribe asks him, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? He doesn't ask him about the two greatest commandments. He, ask, he asks, what, what must I do to gain eternal life? Luther would answer, all you have to do is believe. No commandments. There's no need for works. All you must do is believe. Have faith. And that's it. Sola fides. That's what Luther would say. Now, Protestants, to be honest, Protestants in our day don't really believe this. They, maybe they know that Luther taught that. Maybe they know that at least Protestantism was beholden to that idea at some point. Now most Protestants, in their, in their heart of hearts, they don't really believe that. They say they do, but they don't. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But that is what Luther would say. Only believe. What must I do to gain eternal life? Believe. And our Lord says to him, no. He says, you must do. You must do. And he gives two commandments. Two commandments in which the whole of the law are, is, is fulfilled. And it is very significant that our Lord, at this moment where you can see that he's trying to give the most summarized answer possible, the shortest answer possible, the simplest answer possible, he doesn't say, just believe. 
He says, these are the commandments that you must keep, you must do. Faith alone does not suffice. Charity has to be there. The love of God that makes you work, that makes you do good works. And what are these, those two, these works? Our Lord summarizes them into two. The first one is, you will love the Lord thy God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with all your strength. That is the first tablet of the law. The one that has the three commandments, the first three commandments. And the second commandment is much is similar to this one. Thou shalt not love your neighbor, thy neighbor as thyself. And that is the other tablet of the law, the one with the other seven commandments. And so there, my dear friends, if you notice, the whole premise of Protestantism is done away with. It doesn't suffice to believe alone because there is no true faith that doesn't lead to the love of God and true charity and to works. And the real sign that you have true faith is when that leads all the way up to charity. So that's what our Lord says. I said also that our Lord gives us an argument that is uh, a contundent argument, a, a finishing, you could say, argument against Vatican II. And this is the most important one that there is. He says that the thing that we must do to gain eternal life is to love the Lord our God with your whole soul, with your whole mind, all, all the rest of it. He's quoting actually, the, uh, he's quoting the Old Testament. Why do I say that that goes directly against Vatican II? Well, let me ask you a question. And I've said this before repeatedly in my sermons. If you've heard it before, I'm sorry. But if someone asks you, why do you go to the Latin Mass? You will say, well, because I know that this is a true Mass. You will say because the changes in Vatican II were wrong. You will say because this is more reverent, because this is uh, much more uh, respectful to God, because this is a much more ancient rite, whatever it is. And the truth is, if someone asks you about the changes in Vatican II, the main thing that you would say is they changed the Mass. They changed the sacraments. That's strong. And actually, the main thing that is wrong with Vatican II is what our Lord says here. Vatican II directly, directly contradicts this commandment of our Lord. I was saying that our Lord quotes from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, this commandment begins like this. It says, Hear, O Israel, this is, the, this is like the Our Father for the Jewish people. Shema, Israel. Hear, Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind and with thy whole strength. That's the whole of the commandment. And if you notice, Vatican II teaches exactly the opposite. And that is the main, the core tenet of all the teachings of Vatican II that are erroneous. And this is the main thing that you see all the false popes after Vatican II teach. Our Lord says, you will love the Lord thy God and you will have no strange gods before me because he's basically quoting the commandment. So thou shall have no strange gods before me that shall love the Lord thy God with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with your whole strength. And there comes John Paul II and says, no, worship Shiva. No, you worship also Allah. No, I'll kiss the Quran. I'll receive the mark of Shiva or, or whichever mark he received from the Hindu religion. I will go and summon all the false religions with all their false gods and deities to come and pray together. And while our Lord said, you will have no strange gods before me, I, John Paul II, say, have all the gods that you want and pray to all of them. I will pay for your trip to Assisi to do it. And after him comes Benedict XVI, the traditional pope, doing exactly the same and bringing even an atheist into that meeting. And after him comes Francis, who not only does that, he goes into synagogues to light their candles and he has a video at the beginning of his pontificate bringing together Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Christianity have all strange gods before you. And then he brings a pagan idol, the Pachamama, which is an idol of a woman that has one beast on the one side, breastfeeding, and on the other side, a baby that is also being breastfed. 
and he brings that into the gardens in the Vatican and has those idols worshipped. And so when you're asked, what's wrong with Vatican II? When you're asked, why do you go to the Latin Mass? Why don't you go to your diocese Mass, to the, your parish Mass? You could go into all kinds of theological argu arguments. <coughs> you could go and try to figure out what changes were done in the Mass, whether if it was Bugnini or someone else, and all these kind of historical arguments, and you would be wasting time. Because you need to say, what is the main commandment? The first one that our Lord gave us. What must I do, Lord, to gain eternal life? Love the Lord thy God with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with your whole strength. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. In there, in Vatican II, in that parish, in the diocese, they teach the opposite. Not that they don't teach this anymore. They teach the opposite of it. That's what we call ecumenism. And that's why we don't follow Vatican II. Now, we come into the second commandment that our Lord gave us, to love, thy neighbor, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And here is, I allow me to touch on this, there, there is, here is one of the sources of confusion with Vatican II, because a lot of people will say, John Paul II was very charitable, and Benedict XVI and Francis, is, they're all very charitable. They love men a lot. You know, they go and do these works of charity and they, they're always calling for unity and they're calling for peace and so forth and so forth. Let's say that that was true. Let's say that that was true, that they were keeping the second commandment without keeping the first, as we have proven. That helps you for nothing. That would avail you nothing. Because our Lord did not say in the gospel, you will keep this commandment or the other. You can do this to save your soul, or you can do that if you want. He didn't say that. He said, this is what you must do to save your life, to save your soul. And after this commandment, the most important one, comes the second. You do this and the other, not this or the other. And so if John Paul II and all these false popes and all the Vatican II religion was very friendly and they loved everyone and kumbaya, that would be good for nothing and they would not be pleasing to God because they are not keeping the first one. But the truth is, they are not keeping the second commandment either. Because we must love our neighbor in the same way that we are built. We are built with two levels, the supernatural, the spiritual, and the material. I have a soul and a body, and my friends and my neighbors and my brothers and sisters have also souls and bodies. And I must love them entirely, soul and body, not just their body. And if I love someone only materially in their body, that is not true love. That is not true charity. Why do I say this then? Because if you truly love your neighbor, you must procure first and foremost the good of their soul, and after that, the good of their body. And even the saints that went and did charitable works, such as curing the ill, or feeding the hungry, or giving water to the thirsty, or visiting people in prisons, <coughs> excuse me, they did that with the purpose of opening a door to take care of their soul, which was the most important part. And so here you see that the love that the false religion of Vatican II shows, it's false. It's loving the bodies, but it's not loving the souls. Because you will have Francis and Benedict and John Paul II saying, feed the sick, feed the hungry, and clothe the naked, and all these things. But then when you say, should we teach them the faith? They say, no. Leave them in their falsehoods. Leave them in their false gods. Leave them in those things that don't allow them to save themselves for eternal life. I'll give you an example. Imagine that there is a soldier, and this soldier is in battle, and I am the medic for that soldier. And this soldier is in battle, he gets, pff, a bomb explodes, he gets all wounded, you know, his stomach is open, his guts are coming out, blood coming everywhere. I always, I'm always very graphic in my examples. And he also had a wound in his foot, in his, yeah, in one of his foot. And I'm the medic, and I run over, and I bring him to my position, to my battle station, where I'm going to, you know, take care of him. And then I see him, and I'm like, 
I'm going to cure your foot. And the other nurse says, he's dying. Look, look at this wound over here. Like his guts are coming out. He's got blood everywhere. This is going to kill him. Cure this first. No, 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 no. I'm going to take care of it. I won't take care of that. I'll take care of the foot. If you were to see that, you would say, this guy is evil. You would say, this guy's trying to kill this person. He's trying to have him killed. He's trying to, to let him die. Why would he not do that otherwise? Why wouldn't he take care of the most important part? That is exactly what happens in the spiritual matter, in spiritual matters, with Vatican II, with the diocese, with all these false authorities of the church. They are that priest that sees the man wounded and walks by and does not take care of the big wounds that this person has. The Vatican II says, I will cure your foot. I will worry about poverty. I will worry about world peace. I will worry about climate. But I will not worry about the things that are leading you to eternal hell. I will not worry about teaching you the truths of faith and morals, nor to you, nor to those in false religions. And that's why that behavior must be named and called for what it is, murderers and evil. It's not love, not even the appearance of love. You cannot love your neighbor in the body and abhor him and hate him in the soul. If you love him, you must love him entirely. First soul, then body. My dear friends, to end this, this sermon, that mm, is a bit about the same as usual. What must we do then? Our Lord is telling us, put God first in your life, have God be your main priority, and that is that must be the focus of everything that you must do in order to save your soul. To love a God with your whole soul, with your whole mind, with your whole strength, that every power in your body goes to serve God, that every thought that you have is aimed, ultimately at least, to serve God, that every potency in your soul, your memory, your understanding, your will, is employed, ultimately again, to, say, to, to love God. Maybe you have to work, maybe you have to make a living, maybe you have to do, take care of many businesses that are not directly related to God, but ultimately you say to yourself, the reason why I do this is because God wants me to do it. I go to work because God wants me to do it. I go to study because God wants me to do it. And after that, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. First the soul, then the body. And the first thing that you must procure for your neighbor is to instruct them in the truth, to get them out of sin, to correct them when they're wrong and you're able to correct them. <coughs> when it falls upon you, when it's your duty, when, they will, when you know that they can actually benefit from your advice. That's the first thing that you do. And after that, and subordinated to that, you show them love materially. You show them love in material matters, in feeding them, in giving them drink, in being hospitable to them. This is, my dear friends, these people are your real neighbors those who correct you, those who lead you to God, those who oppose you when you do sin, those who inspire you always to be closer to God. That is your real neighbor. And as our Lord, I would ask you this, who is your real neighbor? And I hope that you will answer also, he who has mercy on what? On my soul and then on my body so that I may love God with all my heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.